Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to another Engage 24 podcast. My name is James, and I am here, as ever, with my co-host, Peter. Peter, how are you? I am doing very well, thank you. How are you getting on? Fine, thank you. Right, a couple of things before we get into the meat of this podcast. Number one, are you enjoying the Euros? Very much. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't sort of see the first few days, but I have been watching lots of the games this week. Good. All right. Well, the obvious game that we need to talk about, the one that everyone is dying for us to talk about, is I thought Portugal did really well with Cristiano Ronaldo leading the line <laughs> brilliantly. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Yeah, but well, we don't need to go into too much detail well, on that. Well, we don't. But just for the record, <laughs> I'm right, you're wrong. Uh, and then um, let's go to the other great game that people want us to talk about, and that is uh, I thought that Germany were very lucky in the <laughs> game against Scotland, <laughs> wouldn't you say? Uh, I thought you were saying the other day that you primarily support England. Mm. Yeah, I'm very political in that sense. I say what I need to in the correct environment yeah. and audience that I'm in. But let me be absolutely clear. <laughs> I was born and raised in the land of the free, uh, heaven on earth, uh, that is Scotland. And I believe Scotland, um, who actually are playing on the the night that we're recording this, mm. I think they'll do very well. But uh, how did you find the England game? Because uh, they, they certainly tried hard. Uh, I thought it began fairly well. Uh, the worrying thing is we can't keep the ball. Um, I, and so the second half was a bit nerve-wracking in that point of view. I guess one question for you to bring this well, back to the general election. Or do we have to? Why can't, why can't we turn this into a, a, a football podcast for the, <laughs> for the duration of the Euros? I'm pretty sure everyone would enjoy that more. Uh, well, they <laughs> might well do. But um, I guess people sometimes talk about how positive things like if England did well in the Euros mm. that can give a boost to the government yes do you think that will possibly help the Conservatives at this point uh, no is the short answer um, I, I can't see how that would help. In fact, I think one of the things that uh, Labour have tried to do, uh, and I think you would have to say have achieved it to a degree at least, is reposition themselves as a patriotic party. Mm. And we had the normal kind of uh, tweets going out on social media of all, <laughs> all the leaders making sure they were seen watching the game. And I've always thought it's a bit ridiculous. You know, I actually wouldn't mind if a politician, a senior politician came out and just said, and now, you know, I believe Keir Starmer is genuine in his mm. love of football. But if a leading politician came out and just said, I don't like football. I honestly think it would be okay. I don't think that they would lose all the votes that clearly their advisors think they would. Mm. But that's just me. What, what do I know? Uh, I did see one very funny tweet, because you're, you're right, Keir Starmer is quite famous for liking football and supporting Arsenal. Uh, one tweet sort of saying, effectively, how have they managed to make the one politician who likes football the most look the most staged and like he likes it the least, which yeah. did make me laugh. Yeah, but. well, that's it. But then again, maybe that's part of his whole thing, isn't it? Is that it's, you know, he's not slick and full of presentational mm. zeal, but rather he's full of substance and, you know, all of that kind of thing. So, Well, speaking anyway. of substance... Uh, you are moving us on very well. You can tell that there's a bit of a battle that's going to go on this whole podcast. I'm going to try and get us back onto football as much as I can, and you're going to keep dragging us onto <laughs> the election. But I will go along with it. We are here to talk about... Uh, manifestos. Manifestos. Have you read any? Uh, not in full, no. I've read some of the excellent care manifesto analysis, oh, which good. is why we have our laptops out today. Yes, isn't we it? do. Yes, yes, yes. We have our laptops out because you're absolutely right. Head to engage24.org.uk where you will find the latest manifesto analysis updated within hours of the manifestos coming out. And in fact, by this point, most major political parties have released their manifestos. So I wonder if we should just start by saying, okay, what is a manifesto? I know we have touched on this already, but let's just remind people what is a manifesto? Why is it important in an election campaign? Uh, well, a manifesto effectively lists the promises which a party is making about if it was to get into office, this is what we'd implement. So it's sort of like the kind of programme of work which you would look to do if you were in government. Uh, it normally spans various different policy areas. We're going to touch on a few of them today. But it is really important because... First of all, you want to know what you're actually voting for. Mm. Uh, so if you're supporting Labour or the Conservatives or the Lib Dems, you want to know what they would do when they're in office. But secondly, it's a kind of good way of holding uh, a party accountable, isn't it? And yeah. parties which do not keep their promises then tend to be punished later. I was very struck watching 
as I sometimes do, some old clips from previous elections where after one election, the elected prime minister holding his first cabinet uh, held a copy of the manifesto and told his entire top team, this is what we've been elected to deliver. And there are no excuses for not delivering on all of it. Now, as it happened, events, dear boy, events then overtook and that prime minister ended up having to leave office just over a year later. But... But I thought it was striking that that was so front and centre at the very beginning of uh, their his new premiership and the new government. So I do think that although parties don't often manage to deliver everything in their manifestos, so there are limits, uh, at the same time, they are the document. We need some way of having an official record rather than relying on press releases and you know things that the politicians have said in news interviews. We need some official almost contract with the British people. That's almost how it functions. This is our contract. This is what we're going to try to get done over a parliamentary session. Yeah, so almost in biblical terms, I guess the word which we often use as Christians is covenant, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It's sort of a bit like that. Yeah. The kind of covenant with, right. the, with the British people. I'm trying to think who that Prime Minister was. Was it David Cameron? It was, yes. That's right, yes. I was working out purely from... When you said they only had one year well, yeah, yeah. after they were elected, That's I was right. thinking he's the only one I could think I know, of. I know, yeah, that was a bit of a giveaway, but I, I, I just thought it was funny because, of course, it just a reminder that, that you know, we are not in control of events. God is in control mm. of all things, but we are not. And I, I think that's an, that is a constant lesson we need to keep reminding ourselves of because in election times, big promises are made. And I think the danger is we can hold parties rightly accountable but we do also need to remember that sometimes they fail to deliver on manifesto commitments, not because they are evil and malicious and a bunch of liars, but simply because events take over and time has to be used for, say, emergency legislation or things like that. So uh, worth saying that, isn't it? Yes, and I guess that's particularly been the case, ironically, in the last five years, mm. where the Conservatives obviously made all kinds of promises. They pretty much had to tear up, had to tear up. Uh, the vast majority of what they planned yeah. when the world entered a, a global pandemic. So you're absolutely yes, right. and they went through three prime ministers. It's worth saying that had an Indeed. impact as well. Yes. But, but leaving leaving that uh, slight anomaly aside, mm. uh, you're absolutely right. Well, let's dive in then. So again, just to stress, for anyone who wants to understand uh, what the different parties are saying, what are what's the way that we have grouped the manifesto analysis? Just explain the kind of rationale that we've we've gone for in terms of what you can expect to find if you do head to engage24.org.uk. Sure. Well, if you go to the Engage website, you'll be able to click on any of the main parties, and we have broken down their manifestos into the key points around the big policy areas. So things like the economy or domestic policy or foreign policy or defence, education, energy, healthcare. So we've kind of summarised the, the key points of a manifesto underneath those headings. Now within domestic policy that would encompass things like immigration or it might encompass transport or justice and crime. So the, those are some of the things which would go into those big topics. But yeah, we've arranged it by uh, by party, and then beneath that, sort of by kind of a big policy area. And I, I actually think one of the really helpful things about, uh, and you know, this is <laughs> this is going to sound like I'm quite literally making a point to praise um, ourselves, uh, but 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 I am, and I'm going to own it. Um, I, I think one of the great things I've enjoyed about the manifesto analysis is that it covers these broad areas mm. that we've not restricted ourselves to a very narrow set of issues. And I do think that that is a temptation uh, at an election time that as Christians. There are really, really important mm. issues that we want to consider when it comes to voting. And it can be very easy to limit ourselves, for example, to say a pro-life issue or a free speech issue. And what we've tried to do is we are not ignoring those issues, but we're also saying there are other things that you will want to think about, even if they don't feature as prominently as say abortion or assisted suicide, we still want you to think and engage with, well, hold on a minute, Actually, the economy and the policies around the economy also have life and death consequences for people. What are those policies? I think that's a really important point. And I think you're right. Uh, sometimes as Christians, we focus on our key hot button issues. Uh, the Bible obviously speaks into every area of life. Mm. Uh and so it is right that we consider every area mm. of life. Uh, the Bible certainly doesn't present us with a hierarchy of different things. 
which we then have to consider when we vote. But the Bible does not say when you can when you come to voting, you have to think about abortion number one, and you have to think about gender number two and sexuality number three. The Bible just doesn't work like that. It has various things, all of which are important. And then we have to try and weigh up, don't we? Well, actually, which party is going to echo God's heart the most closely across that whole big picture, as opposed to on one or two issues? And that is precisely why I think, and what I find troubling, is I think very often we can try to make it sound as if voting is a really simple, straightforward, mm -hmm. black and white choice. And for all the Christians out there who are perplexed and scratching their heads, that can narrative can be very attractive. Yes, there is one issue that over and above every other issue should dominate my thinking when it comes to voting. And, and I think precisely for the point that you've mentioned, actually, voting is a complicated business because on the one hand, there are, of course, life and death matters, which are all to do with the protection of life. And I would argue from Genesis 9, verses 5 to 6 especially, that is part of the role of government. Mm. Now, any government in a democratic society uh, will protect life in some areas and uphold God's plan for life in those areas and fail in other areas. And that is always going to be the case in the context of a fallen world. And yes, some of those failures are having massive consequences, huge ramifications uh, when it comes to the value of life. But at the same time, I agree with you that the way the Bible is comes to us, the way we're to read the Bible is this holistic vision that we are given about all human life. And how do we grapple with that? It's complex, it's hard. You need to pray, you need to seek God's wisdom, and you need to avoid oversimplifying the choice. Absolutely, and uh, you've sort of touched on it a bit there. I think one of the ironies sometimes when we say we are so pro-life, and particularly if that comes to shape our vote, is our view of being pro-life begins before someone is, is born uh, and ends when they die and basically we don't care about the middle the life in the yeah, middle yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. that would be something I would really want to move away from yes. actually all of life matters yes not just when you're in your mother's womb and not just when you're on your deathbed and I think at the same time I'm entirely comfortable with the idea that if with the conscience that God has given you with your background your experiences and the things that you have gone through. If, for example, abortion is the issue mm. that is most on your heart at this election, I am not going to judge you for a single second. I think where I personally have an issue is where someone for whom abortion is their number one issue then starts to argue and to present and to, to suggest that somehow if that isn't my number one issue, mm. that as a Christian, I'm guilty of sin. Because I have heard that said. Mm. I, I'm troubled by that because I, I understand the heart behind that. I profoundly disagree with where that takes someone. I don't yeah. think that we can be binding other Christians' consciences in that way because what you're implying is you are right, and if they don't agree with you, then they are wrong. Whereas mm. if someone goes to the ballot box and let's be controversial here, climate change is the number one issue for them. Mm. Now, whatever your views on climate change, I think what is irrefutable is that where we have high temperatures, people's lives are put at risk and mm. people die. And more than that, it has massive consequences for farmers, ex these extreme weather patterns, which then has consequences for food distribution, which then have consequences for the prices at the supermarkets, which then have consequences for the poorest in our society. So yeah. we need to get away from this, this, this wretched business of oversimplifying the choice. I'm sorry to speak so passionately, but I, I've, I've been challenged on this and it has made me think. And I think the more I've reflected on it, I think two things have happened. One is I hope I have become more sympathetic towards those for whom a single issue is their number one issue. I want to respect that. But I've also hardened in my view on this is not right to suggest to other Christians that if they don't agree with you on that, that they are sinning. I, I cannot go along with that. And I think probably just to round off this particular yeah. thread, which has actually been very interesting and which we haven't planned, uh, but it has the, been very interesting. I tell you, Peter, the best stuff on this podcast is not planned. <laughs> the football chat and now this chat. <laughs> That's very real. Lots of it is not planned. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, just quickly on that. So, someone said, you know, do you plan these podcasts out? And I was like, um, um, I mean, you know, we certainly have a discussion about what we hope to cover. 
Yeah. Don't we? We do yeah. have a we do yes, have a brief we, conversation. We, we, yeah. we, we do. Yeah. Um, yes. let's, let's not let people into too many of our production secrets. Ah, I know that's right. Yes, yes. yes. Um, Sorry. Yes. Uh, but just to round off yes. this little thread of, <laughs> yes. of conversation, I guess one of the ironies is on some of those issues, actually parties are not going to put anything particularly in their manifesto. Indeed, as we'll see. Yeah, completely. Mm. So... On one level, I, I, I do get, of course, things like abortion and assisted suicide are important. A party is unlikely on conscience issues to say anything more than we'd allow parliamentary time for a free vote. Yeah. Uh, and so we can get very worked up about which party is more or less pro-life. And I guess to just give an example, historically, the Conservatives might be seen as more pro-life when it comes to abortion than Labour would be. Neither of them are going to overturn abortion, uh, our abor- abortion laws in this country to make it illegal. We sometimes kind of operate in this world where we sort of say, well, actually, this party is better on this issue. What are they actually going to do about it? Mm. The Conservatives haven't done anything to roll back abortion. In fact, they imposed it on Northern Ireland Indeed. when the law there had actually led to 100,000 people being alive who otherwise yeah. wouldn't have been. And realistically, Labour, I imagine, would have done the same. Mm. So there isn't necessarily as big a difference mm. on some of these conscience issues as we might think there is. Mm. Uh, but let's dig into let's the manifesto. Do let's do it. And so the way we're going to do this, just to explain, the way we're going to do this is we're going to take five big policy areas mm. and we're going to look at what uh, five of the main parties, so we're not doing every party, we're going to do five of the main parties, what do they say? And we're simply going to pick out some of the highlights and just reflect on them from a Christian perspective. And I, I, I want to stress... Feel free, those watching and listening, you can disagree with us. Mm. This is just uh, two Christians who love Jesus, love the Bible, um, are interested in policies, attempt to uh, analyze it from a Christian perspective. But Mm. it is entirely reasonable if you don't land in the same place as us. Uh, We may not always land in the same place as each other. Let's Mm. just see what happens. I say that by the end of this podcast, there'll be just such harmony and peace. It's almost like we've become one person. (laughs) But um, anyway, we are one in Christ. So that's good news. Right. The economy, first of all. So let's look at the economy. Should we start with the Conservative Party? Oh, well, before we do, why don't we just sort of think about what the Bible might have to say about the Very economy. good idea. Yes, yes. Very good idea. Uh, that was deliberately teed up for you to, to bring that in. <laughs> uh, and, and you say that, but actually this is really helpful. On Engage24 website, another yeah. feature I really like are the topic mm. primers. And the five policy areas and more that you'll find in the manifesto analysis behind each one is a topic primer that gives you the biblical principles mm. behind that policy area. Mm. And you and I wrote some of them... Uh, I think you wrote a few more than me and we had another colleague write them. I found it really interesting writing them. I really enjoyed it because it was so instructive Mm. having to think, wait a minute, what does the Bible say about education? Mm. I think you did one on healthcare. I think you did one on the economy and immigration and you found the same thing. So yes. Okay. So what, what you did the one on the economy, I believe. So you can tell us (laughs) what does the Bible say about the economy, Peter? Oh dear. (laughs) Um, I guess probably the first thing to say is, we can't be expecting the Bible to lay out a list of instructions as to how a government should run our economy in 21st century Britain. Yeah. We made the point on a previous podcast, didn't we, that the Bible is written for us, the Bible is not written to us. Uh, So the societies within uh, the biblical world are primarily... Uh, revolving around agriculture. Today's is, is much more of a consumerist society. Yeah. And um, the Bible talks a lot about how we steward our resources wisely. Uh, so, I mean, each week at my church, when we take the collection, we say, all things come from you, O Lord, and of your own do we give you. Like, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Very Anglican, Peter. No, I know, I know. Very Anglican. Um, do you know what we do? What do you We do? sing all things bright and beautiful. No, you don't. No, we don't. (laughs) (laughs) Isaac liked that one. Um, uh, So uh, the Bible has a lot to say about our personal responsibility when it comes to money. Uh, It doesn't say necessarily very much about whether a government should be more or less interventionist. It does comment, though, on uh, God having a particular concern for those who are poor. Uh, So uh, when Jesus does his Nazareth Manifesto, which we talked about last time. Uh, He says he's come to proclaim good news to the poor. Uh, And there are various measures which are for the benefit of those who are poor, so things like the year of Jubilee, the um, cancellation of loans. There's this sort of tension between the Bible 
in the Bible between measures which are designed to give the poor a hand up, so effectively to help them to help themselves, uh, or giving the poor a hand out, which is just giving them something to help them yeah. in their particular circumstances. So I guess things for us to bear in mind are, is a party going to steward our resources as well? Yeah. Uh, and secondly, what uh, is the government's attitude going to be towards those who are poorest in society? How is it yeah. going to help them move away from poverty? Thanks for listening to the latest episode of the Engage24 podcast. Do check out our special election-themed website, engage24.org.uk, for more resources, where you'll find blogs, topic primers, manifesto analysis, and of course, our Which Party Do I Align With interactive quiz, which has now been done around 20,000 times and only takes about five minutes to do. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, do give us a like. Share the podcast with your friends and please do hit subscribe to get access to more great content to help you engage with politics for this election and beyond. And do enjoy the rest of the episode. Okay, so the economy then. Let's start with the Conservative Manifesto. And I guess the the first thing I would uh, look at here is that they are pledging to cut taxes mm. uh, for workers by taking a further two pence off employee national insurance. And so that will result in it being halved from 12% in early 2024 to 6% by April 2027. And they claim this will result in a tax cut of £1,350 for the average worker on £35,000. Mm. Now, what I find interesting here is this will touch on essentially your political philosophy. Do you believe that people are uh, best placed to make decisions about spending their own money? Mm -hmm. In which case then, I don't see how you could do anything other than support a tax cut like this. Mm -hmm. Or do you believe that if you go down this road, that because we are naturally depraved and because we are therefore naturally selfish, although we are not as bad as we might be, uh, that actually the government need to uh, keep taxes a bit higher in order to generate the funds to run things like welfare programmes and mm. to run some of those hand out programmes, as mm. it were. I think that's a fascinating question. That's what a whole kind of political debate has been about for centuries. And it depends where you sit on that spectrum. Mm. From a, the biblical principles that you articulated mm. earlier, uh, would you say that from a biblical perspective, we can be either for or against tax cuts? Or would you say actually rather you have to look at tax cuts in the round and how they fit alongside other policies? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Latter. I mean, none yeah. of these things exist in, in isolation. No, do no. No. Uh, I guess one of the questions with tax cuts is are they genuinely going to benefit those who are the poorest within society. Um, and arguably not, right? Because this is going to benefit people who are on primarily sort of 35,000k a year, which is the average wage. So anyone under the average wage, although they will feel some benefit, they're not going to feel the maximum benefit. Mm. So the high, more you earn, the higher, the more you're laughing. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty true. All the way to and the actually, bank. And if actually, you, if you contrast this with one of the policies from reform, I think they're tax policies are designed to benefit those who are poorest more than, more than they are from the Conservatives. I guess one of the things which is potentially a positive thing within the Conservative manifesto is this idea of basically not taxing pensioners. Yes. Uh, so the triple lot plus, which Rupert yeah. Sunak's been making a, a lot of noise about. I guess if we were looking to be cynical or possibly realistic, one might say this is just a bid to go after voters who are more elderly. Though. Which is generally their core vote anyway. Yeah. The other thing I did think was good from a Christian perspective is they are promising to ensure access to 15 hours of free childcare for eligible mm. families. Now, I'm, I'm both torn on this one because this is absolutely a concession to how our society functions now, mm. where because both parents more than likely are working and go back to work after having a baby, that having free childcare is necessary. Also, families are more fragmented, they're more split, so access to grandparents, aunts, uncles isn't a given at all. So at this, on the one hand, I think, well, that is just how things are, and so some accommodation needs to be made so that you know we can have children and yet still afford to live where we're paying mm. mortgages and things. But there are some MPs who are looking at this and going, this is unsustainable. Mm. And actually this this is not the answer to, it's not tackling the root cause of things like family breakdown of family fragmentation. And it doesn't really help make the UK a society where it is a good thing to have children. Mm. So I wonder if there are some deeper questions that 
even a policy like that, that on the surface looks good, that prompts certainly in my mind around, well, is this just a kind of sticking plaster approach to a much, much deeper issue? So I think there's things to weigh up when it comes to that one. Uh, if we move on to Let's do it. labour, so I guess one of the principles which we talked about as a key Christian principle is stewarding your resources. Uh, one of Labour's one of Labour's big focuses is to introduce spending limits, isn't it? Uh, yes. So to make sure that they don't overspend. I guess this is looking to counteract a historic view of Labour, which is that Labour would be higher spend, higher taxes. Yeah. I think it's also particularly designed to capitalise on the financial mismanagement which there was under Liz Truss um, when the economy crashed. Uh, but certainly any emphasis on stewarding resources wisely is a good one. And I saw a very interesting chart actually a few days ago which compared different spending pledges <laughs> and Labour's was way down yeah, compared yeah. to the other party. So That's it's a very different strategy. And I think also you could look at the fact they're committed to confronting poverty. Yeah. Uh, the fact they're talking about that mm. uh, much, perhaps much more openly. Again, th this is more natural to the Labour Party movement. But one of the things I found interesting in our summary of what they're saying in the manifesto is there does seem to be an attempt to be balanced because on the one hand, they're reviewing universal credit to make work pay and mm. protecting things like the living wage. And in fact, in, uh, increasing the minimum wage, but they also want to make sure that they're helping people get into good work as well. Mm. And it, that biblical balance then of both a hand out and a hand up does seem to be coming across there. Um, interestingly, they're also saying they're going to retain the triple lock for the state pension. So not the triple lock plus, but the triple lock. Yeah. And again, there are questions that is both a good thing on the one hand, we want to make sure we care for those who are uh, older and not working. At the same time, again, there are questions raised about whether that is sustainable mm. and whether that contributes to an economic imbalance in our society where uh, if you're retired right now, things mm. are great. W generally speaking, whereas for our generation, we're going to have to work longer before we can claim our pension and questions around whether we'll get as much. But um, that's very interesting. I also find it really interesting, again, that, that uh, they're committed to things like investment as well. Mm. And again, that thing of, will that mean that we create more jobs? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I guess well, in, obviously a good thing. in terms of fairness as well, uh, things like abolishing the non-dom status yeah. uh, is probably a very good thing. Uh, looking to end loopholes for avoiding inheritance tax as well. Yeah. So there is an emphasis there, isn't there, yeah. in terms of looking to make sure that tax cuts are in the right place. Yes. Uh, and looking to address inequality. That's right. Yep. Okay. Should we look at Lib Dems? Go for it. All right. So Lib Dems, one of the things that, that again strikes me in our analysis is they are talking very explicitly about the cost of living crisis, mm. um, which didn't come through in the Labour or the Conservative um, analysis that, that we did. Uh, they want to cut energy bills through an emergency home energy update program. Uh, and they also want to launch a national food strategy as well. Uh, and they want to get mortgage rates under control through careful economic management, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. Because what does that mean? Uh, that would be my question on that latter point. But at the same time, a national food strategy, I've been very struck watching Clarkson's farm about the fragility that is built into our farming mm. and the dangers that farmers are facing and the challenges. And so I think a national food strategy potentially could be a really good thing. And that is explicitly about stewardship. Mm. Uh, I guess one of the key strategies for the Lib Dems uh, is going to be rejoining the single market, isn't it? So the Lib Dems have always been historically pro-Europe. Uh, famously, uh, they wanted to reverse the result of the referendum or basically have a second referendum on it. Um, I guess this is one of those areas where we start to see the difficulties of engaging with some of these topics as a Christian, because obviously the Bible does not say you should be pro-Brexit or you should be anti-Brexit. No, indeed. Um, so there are different strategies to achieve particular goals. Mm. Um, and it's not always easy to weigh up biblically, uh, which is the better strategy for achieving something. So is the Lib Dem strategy of rejoining Europe uh, in the long run? Um, a better strategy than Labour. Well, the Bible doesn't necessarily speak into those questions. I, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's helpful. Uh, what about the Greens? Uh, well, the, the Greens are uh, always uh, uh, pretty pretty pro uh, raising taxes on the wealthy. Um, yes, yeah, so our first point here is they're calling for a greater wealth tax on those who are most able to pay. Listen, I'm just going to be honest. Whenever I hear stuff like this, I, I th there is a there is there is a logic to it. There seems mm. to be a fairness to it. Shouldn't those who earn more carry more responsibility for paying more tax, except, of course, the argument would go, they are already paying more tax. Yeah. Because 
if you earn more and the tax rate, the income tax rate is set at a certain level, then you're inevitably going to pay more if you earn more. So, yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's uh, a helpful point. It's also worth saying again when it comes to strategies. Uh, obviously, it in theory that makes sense, but then if you end up with say some of those who would be paying tax here moving elsewhere, yeah, or well, then potentially it's the poorest who suffer from that as well. So that yes. kind of is a a good rejoinder to it in that generally it's a good approach isn't it to go for balance yes uh between making sure you don't overtax uh the wealthy so that they don't move somewhere else and then that's everyone that's, loses out that's exactly right i tell you one other thing that did jump out at me is that they're committed to abolishing the two child benefit cap mm. which is something i would absolutely support personally and so i think i was pleased to see them actually making that explicit commitment and actually that is in contrast to the labor party and you wouldn't necessarily expect labor to be pro that but that is all part of Labour's desire uh, to be seen as fiscally responsible they're saying they couldn't fund that at this time now I think I as a Christian from the sidelines feel a bit nervous around that because I would personally say that's a priority to end that and um, that's not me having a go at the Labour Party because the Conservatives also uh, would, would not be abolishing it yeah uh, I can't remember what all the parties would do um, but yeah, it is worth being aware of what parties are currently saying as opposed to what you might think they stand for. I agree, yeah. Um, and again, then, uh, I think one of the things that the Green Party talk about is a windfall tax as well on big companies, oil and gas. I, I suspect there'd be, uh, if you were to poll a windfall tax right now, uh, as, as has happened historically, you'd get strong support for it. Mm. There is the idea that big companies get away with a lot. And mm. especially when you see such chronic mismanagement, I'm thinking of companies like Thames Water, who have gotten such yeah. enormous debt. Isn't it fair that actually we hold some of these big companies to accounts? And so, again, something that you, you may chime with you, you may think is a good idea. I guess there are arguments always against. Mm. Um, what about reform? So, <laughs> interesting, yes. So, interestingly, one of the things that they, uh, they've they talked about is a transferable allowance, for example. Mm. Um, and I'm guessing that applies to married couples. And, excuse me, <coughs> goodness me, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, we're just going to have to live with that. That's not, by the way, a comment on reform. Um, so a transferable allowance is something that CARE has argued for and campaigned for um, in the in the past. Mm. In that this is a way that you can show you support marriage in mm. the tax system. And the UK has a highly individualistic tax system. I mean, it's kind of absurd, really, because what it means is if you've got a family of four with just one of the adults earning, that family is taxed in exactly the same way as a single person uh, who has a job. And so obviously the difference is that the family of four, that one earner, is trying to feed four people, whereas mm. the single person is feeding just one person. So their outgoings are going to be less, but they're taxed in exactly the same way. There is no acknowledgement paid to the fact that that one earner has a family that they're trying to provide for. Mm. So this has long been a problem, and Reform are the only party who have even mentioned the words transferable allowance in their manifesto. So from a Christian point of view, that that is in the, in the plus column. Yeah, and I think I am also personally in favour of them lifting the income tax starting point to 20,000 a year so that fewer people uh, pay if they can't afford to. Yeah. I think my slight caution on reform... Yes, do add a caution, please. Um, it is, and they have actually been quite explicit about this. Basically, they don't think that they're going to win, so they've sort of promised a bunch of stuff which they know they're not going to have to enact. Yes. And that is, to some extent, going against what we were talking about at the start in terms of what a manifesto is and why it's important, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, so you can make all kinds of nice-sounding promises if you know you do not have to deliver them. I totally agree. Yeah. Then again, I kind of sympathise a little bit because I'm like, well, they're not wrong. And so they're really just kind of giving you a vision for what the country could be if given enough time they were able to kind of work their way there incrementally. Yeah. Hey everyone, hope you really enjoyed part one of our election manifesto analysis. Stay tuned for part two, which will be dropping shortly and available wherever you get your podcasts.